Here's the big moment. Let's see if I don't screw it up. Hi everyone, my name is Jeff Starr and this is my channel, Not Bad Films. I make videos about music and today I am talking to Will Marsh, who is a uh, sitarist, educator, professional musician. Uh, I'm going to call you maybe electronics guru <laughs> of some sort. Um, and the reason I wanted to have Will on for one of these interviews is because he's done something that I think is very interesting, which is uh, he spent several years developing a pickup system for a sitar. And if you're familiar with the sitar, you know that it is not necessarily uh, very conducive to electronics and pickups. It's, and, and it likes to fight modern technology sometimes. <laughs> so tell us about this, this pickup system that you developed for the sitar and how is it different from some of the other like tran transducer systems that sit underneath the bridge or um, are designed that, that you see sort of sold by other retailers? Right, so the first distinction I wanna make is it's not a traditional sitar as in the gourd body, you know, old fashioned regular sitar. It's actually made of a wood body. And since it's right here, I might as well kind of show it as I'm speaking. That'd be great. And so this, you know, allows it to be a lot thinner the body is solid wood. And then on the headstock, we use the guitar tuners. Uh, let me bring that up. Yeah. Otherwise, all the rest are your your regular wood into wood um, tuning pegs. Yeah, yeah. I was resistant to playing a sitar like this because I never heard one that really sounded good to me. And I never wanted to compromise the real sound of sitar. It's got to have that resonance. And I had played a number of ones of like these and they just they didn't resonate and i was kind of like oh, i'm just not into this yeah but then when when i heard this particular one that's made by kanai lal i was like wow this really feels like a sitar it sounds like a sitar it's resonant and that's what got me started on the whole idea of then adding a pickup system so this was kind of the the first point was finding this instrument and then so getting back to your question of you know what's unique about the pickup system um I am actually not the electronics guru. I, I found my electronics <laughs> guru and it's a guy by the name of David Enke. And he has been working with pickups for over 30 years. And he started a company called Pick Up the World oh, wow. that um, specialized in world music instrument pickups um, in Got the it. 80s in Colorado. And so I got in touch with him and we started working together. I started sharing my idea that, you know, I really... When, when you play sitar outside of a classical context and say you're in a setting where there's a drum set and a key keyboard player, like sitar is just not going to yeah. be in the mix. It's like so you lost. can't, yeah. it's so lost and it's frustrating when you want to represent this beautiful instrument and it just can't be heard. So I really had a, a real need as a musician for an instrument that could plug in and, and perform under these type mm -hmm. of situations. So I started talking to David and, and he sells a pickup that just kind of sticks on the surface and then has a quarter inch jack. Yeah. And I would use that on my traditional sitar and, and it was a nice pickup. So I was like, okay, this guy's making good stuff. Um, but even that it's hard to get enough gain from it. And I don't like having something that is kind of like loose, you know, it's not fully stuck on. And then you have like this little hanging part and it <laughs> sure. can rattle and, so that wasn't really like an end solution for me either. So David and I just started different ideas and we, we tried different things that didn't work. Um, at first he was like, let's put it underneath the main bridge mm -hmm. on the body because then it'll be getting the volume from through the bridge and then into it and the body resonating. Yeah. So it's kind of like a double um, spot of resonance. But we, what we found there is like, the sitar bridges, like they'll move a little bit when you do serious memes, yeah. like. Yeah. So that was actually squeaking and even tearing up the pickup eventually. Yeah. And I want people to have the option to have a floating bridge if they like that style. Totally. Can, can I pause so, you for one quick second? Is your, yeah. is your Zoom audio set to original audio? Good call. What was just happening now is when you were playing the meme that, it's like noise canceling, cut it off. Okay, so now original sound is on. So now. It should be through this condenser yep. right here. Kind 
Perfect. Sound like it's Yes, I can cool. hear you there now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I always forget that sound. No, no. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> it's a, I only know it because of, of doing online lessons because of COVID and stuff, you know, like. Right. Yeah. And actually, that's perhaps actually a really good example of why a sitar doesn't always translate well through a mic'd environment because it has so much resonance and sustain that, you know, when you're playing live, it's very easy for, um, for the microphone to be loud enough with its preamp to pick up those subtleties for it to immediately start to like feedback, right? That was an experience that I certainly ran into. Yep. Um, and, and we've had as, as a problem on, on, um, with my Ustad when he's performed live, sometimes like you're trying to keep, you know, the top player wants a little more of the sitar or something in the, in the monitor and all of a sudden it starts feeding back. And there's so many overtones. Yeah. It's like, yeah. So I think that's why this concept is really interesting to me, but the, the, on the body pickups I've heard in the past have always sounded really lifeless. And I, I yep. think, so this sort of journey you've been on to sort of like fix that is, is, it's sort of like why this conversation was appealing to me. So right. when the pickup was sitting underneath the bridge, you were saying that the, the little micro movements of the bridge were actually wearing the pickup out over time. Yep, they actually damaged it. And it just wasn't, and then you'd get like a little bit of a squeak sound. It would emphasize some of the sound of the sitar is so complex. Like when we're doing these means, there's a little bit of like a sound of the string moving across the bridge. Yeah. And it was getting more of that than was desirable. Mm. And when we went internally, we, we don't get that particular sound that we don't want anymore. Instead, we just get a really clean sound of, of the instrument vibrating. Yeah. So your pickup is then attached on the inside of the, the instrument? Exactly. So it is inside the body. This is a wood body that's hollowed out mm -hmm. and it's attached to the surface directly underneath where the main bridge is so it's like right right in there on the surface Got it. mounted there my understanding is like you are sort of selling this as a as a straight package right like it's a it's the sitar with the pickup installed correct correct and the pickup coming out is it just coming out a quarter inch jack or is it a mic xlr what is that connection there yeah good question so i'll show you the unit it's a quarter inch okay. and it also features a master volume knob mm. and it's powered it has a custom-made preamp for the pickup that is powered by a nine volt battery that has a little slot right here sure a little battery door there yeah 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 a little battery door and so this is the the unit itself quarter inch output master volume and then your battery to power the preamp got it now i would imagine <laughs> designing that preamp or at least working with some existing preamps was probably its own little adventure to find something that didn't color the sound too much. Is, is there anything behind that you want to share? Exactly. And so this is the genius of the electronics guru, David Enke. <laughs> and um, he's, the, he's the man. So he has been working on developing, he custom makes preamps already. And he's all about like as little coloration as, as possible. He really wants the sound of the instrument acoustically. Yeah. So this is an ultra low um, impedance FET. These things I can't really speak much more about, but sure. I had a call with David. I was like, I want to know how to describe yeah. your, your pickup. And so he said it's an ultra low um, FET transistor preamp. So wow. what that translates to, to people that aren't know all these technical specs is that It'll allow you to plug into anything and it'll it'll sound good and it's also not going to overdrive or it's trying not to overcolor um the natural sound of the instrument Love and that's it. that's his been his goal as a as a pickup maker yeah. and, and how, somebody how long did you guys spend on this project i would say three and a half years okay. um until we came to what we have now we were developing yeah three and a half years we we tried different things mm -hmm. and yeah different combinations um now I'm I'm gonna definitely want you to to play so that we can hear it for a little bit. But mm -hmm. before we do that, um, can you tell people how long you've been you've been studying sitar and a little just very briefly what your background is in music? For sure. Um, so I've been playing sitar for about 14 years now. And prior to sitar, I had a lot of background in guitar. Mm -hmm. 
uh, classical jazz. I was lucky to attend this amazing arts academy for high school called the Interlochen Academy of the Arts. And it's basically a boarding arts um, school where you know you really get to learn classical repertoire sure. and composition ear training. So I was really lucky to have that immersion into music. And then the school that I really wanted to continue studying music at is called the California Institute of the Arts. Oh um, yeah, it's in Ke Los Cal Angeles. Arts, yeah. Cal Arts. So I was drawn there because I was like, okay, I, I learned a, a lot of cool music, Western music, but I want to learn other style. Like there's the world of music is so broad. Yeah, yeah. And Cal Arts has a world music, like you actually perform. It's not writing papers about other music. It's like you, you play and study. So I was like, that sounds amazing. And I just, to make a long story short, it's like getting into the Indian music room and being around it. It was like a magnet. And <laughs> I thought I would remain a guitar player and be like, guitar is my thing yeah. and I'm going to take influences. But once I got a sitar in my hands, that was like it. When you, when you study at Cal Arts then for music, is it a series of just teachers or did you later find like say a, a guru or, uh, that you sort of decided to learn from? Through Cal Arts, the full-time faculty there is uh, Ustad Ashish Khan. Okay. Um, he's the eldest son of Ali Akbar Khan, mm -hmm. um, many people know. And so that's who I got the the blessing to learn with and begin my training with is with um, Ustad Ashish Khan, and so all my time at Cal Arts, I was you know working pretty closely with him, and he would teach individual lessons as well as group classes sure. and vocal, and so that was my my first kind of um, step into the music, my first guidance, and uh, Ashishji is a saro, his main instrument is sarod. So there was a time when I really wanted some more sitar specific um, training and that's when I started learning from uh, sitar player Roshan Jamal Bhartia. And he's a fantastic sitar player and he's based out of the Denver area. He, he moved from India in the 90s and has mm. stayed here since. Um, and he's a multi-generational sitar player. So that's where I kind of started learning more sitar specific from him. Uh, and then continuing on, I, I now learned from a sitar player based out of Mumbai, and his name is Tushar Bhaita. And I've just been really lucky to meet great musicians. He was in the States like for a really short time. A friend knew his distant relative uh -huh. he was staying with, and they were like, you should meet this sitar player, yeah. you know? And I was like, okay. And it just really, really clicked with him. Um, I've been learning with him for, f I think, five years now. Oh, wow. um, great. We, meet, we meet on Zoom. I go to India when I can which hasn't been in the last year sure. and a half. But usually it would be every year for a month or so. Yeah, It's really important to share the gurus. And I also had the good fortune to study some bit with Shakir Khan, who is uh, the son of Shahid Parvez. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I met him when he was in, in my town I was living in, and he did a concert. And so I feel really lucky to have so much guidance. Um, Ashish Khan, Roshan Bhartia, Shakir Khan and currently Tushar Baita. So, I mean, without these guys, I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be uh, the sitar player sure. that I am today. So yeah. thank you for asking. Yeah, amazing. When we first started talking and I was, was checking out your stuff, I could tell that you were very serious because, and this is gonna sound weird, <laughs> but I could tell you were very serious about your study and education in this music because you have, um, you have sitar finger, right? You have that Ms. <laughs> Rob finger right yes that 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 all um all good sitar players get you know from all the, the callus buildup of wearing your Rob for like a thousand hours a day and um and i was like okay he's doing a lot of practicing and then i watched some of your videos and they're, they're very articulate and very well done so so will i want you to tell me what style of sitar are you playing is it a, a gundahar panchum style sitar what do you have going on there so i've actually kind of found myself in a hybrid of the two okay and this is because i started learning in in the maihar garana which is you know ravi shankar's yep. garana and the karaj pancham um and then i've continued to learn in the in the etawar imdad khani style the vilayat khan lineage mm -hmm. and I feel like there's such beautiful things about both garanas and the way that i have made it a hybrid is that I take the low pa, low pa, but then I don't take the extra low karich. Okay. And then there is where I have, I still have gundar if I'm playing 
a rag with say a major third. So I still have Gundar Punchum. Yeah. And then I also have Wow. And it's a combination and you know, I give credit to the guys who play on the low low card yeah. and do all the beautiful mean but for me I'm like I've got enough work cut out <laughs> on just this one yeah. and when I'm playing a lop and jor I can do this yeah I have to say just also watching you just retune right now made me really jealous for your guitar tuners oh yeah I didn't think about that well how do you tune your instrument are you in in D or C sharp or? Good question. So these ones, the, the travel ones, I like to have them in D. Yep. But my, my acoustic sitar that is here, this is a, a Barun Ray Gunder Punchum sitar. I like this in C sharp. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And and it, yeah, I, something about there's a little more warmth in, in C sharp on my full acoustic sitar. Yeah, I, I find the instrument really wants to dictate how it wants to be tuned sometimes. You know? Right. Can anyone can can someone get this sitar from you in either sort of style and let's say that Ravi Shankar style, that Vilayat Khan style, or or is or is it just yeah, coming your hybrid style? That's a good question. Well, I actually make it the hybrid. The the maker sends them Karaj Pancham to me. Okay. Um and the thing that I like about that is if you are Gunder Pancham, you essentially have one less string. Mm -hmm. And so if you wanted to play Gunder Pancham you could do like what I'm doing as the hybrid and you could just ultimately remove the paw string sure. or we have the clips on it to kind of clip it down when you're not playing it. Um, so if you were like, I really want a Gundar Poncham, you could essentially remove that extra string. Um, I would put it on for you if you ordered it that way. Um, and, you know, I, I, I can start stocking some from the maker, but I find that it's nice that by ordering Courage Poncham, you can kind of then make it sure. as you like. Yeah. Um, so that's it's, that's what I've been doing so far because yeah. I haven't had anyone be like, I want a purely Courage um, Gundar Poncham style got it, one. Got it. So and do you then also do you have to ch reshape the Jawari at all to adjust for that? I've found that it's pretty easy transition because the Gundar string, like you don't fret it, right? Yeah. So as long as it sounds like pretty clear which I find if you take off a card string and then you put on a gunder, it sounds pretty good. There's yeah. not any kind of weird buzz. And I'm not a Jawari expert, so um, sure. yeah, that, I'm glad that that works because otherwise it would be more challenging. Yeah. When I'm thinking about how this, this setup is and I'm trying to compare it to something else, I immediately think of, let's say, like, a, like an arch top, hollow body, or, or F-hole style uh, jazz guitar, like a big jazz box guitar. Mm -hmm. And those are really notorious for feedback. Are you ha running into issues with feedback? And if not, how are you working around that? It's been really minimal. Um, you'll see when I play, I mean, my, the amp is right here yeah. and I'll get it to a pretty good volume. And I think a lot of that is due to the style of the pickup. Um, the pickup that we're using is a transducer contact. Mm -hmm but it's it's made out of polymer which is a material that was used in the aerospace industry and it was it wasn't public until like even 20 years ago it was like a military secret Got it. <laughs> and so yeah it's this thing that david was one of the first guys to start using it because of um it, it uses a piezo system but when you think of piezo you think of like tinny thin metallic sound right and yeah. that's because the piezo is using like a ceramic or crystalline base mm -hmm. and polymer is like a whole other material that doesn't give you that tinny metallic sound got it so essentially we get the benefits of the transducer contact system where it's less prone to feedback mm -hmm. but it doesn't put us in that thin tinny sound yeah, that, category that, because of the polymer yeah the the way that those those uh I always say piezo, piezo. I never know what or, it is. Yeah, but piezo, yeah. It is. But that, that crystal system, it just sounds, uh, it sounds so crystally, I guess. You know, it's not, I don't know how. It's harsh. It's very harsh. It's harsh. Yeah. It hurts and then the I, ears. I feel like you end up having to color that sound to try and make it sound like a, an acoustic. So can you tell me a bit more about your relationship with um, Kanai Lal and Sons? Definitely. So 
the way that I discovered their sitar that I love and use as, as the instrument for this whole system mm -hmm. is um, a student of mine just like was like, check out the sitar I got. And that's when I was really impressed with, you know, like I said, this wood body sitar. I, yeah. I was not impressed with these type of instruments until I heard um, Kanai Lal's. And so Kanai Lal happens to make the sarodes for Ashish Khan, my, oh, okay. my first guru. And so I got in touch with him through through Ashishji, and I was spending time in Calcutta every year at this time where Kanai Lal's shop is. So I got in touch and I ordered one of these and I kind of met up with him and um, yeah, I got to personally meet him and order one. And that was kind of like, I wanted to see, is it as good as my students? Mm -hmm. Like what's what's the, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah what is what is a standard of, of his production? And, and it was a great instrument. So then when I decided to start pursuing this project, I had a direct relationship with him and was immediately able to kind of order more. And I actually went and picked him up and flew oh, back wow. with them when I when I got a first few orders. So and he's just like a super humble, um, hardworking person. And, you know, a lot of people will be like, oh, you're do you go to the sitar factory and they make a term like <laughs> And I'm like, do you do, I don't think you realize it's made in a room that's probably smaller than your bedroom yeah. <laughs> where they just sit on the floor and they barely use power tools. And like all of his lacquers are in like seven up, but like it's very <laughs> like, it, it's just, it's not what you would expect, but you know, he puts such dedication into every instrument. I've never gotten one that I'm like, oh, this doesn't sound good. Wow. And that's the biggest concern being a foreigner ordering instruments yeah. is if you get someone who's just like, okay, they're going to order 10 and I have no incentive to make sure every one is as good as it can sound. So that's a long way of saying like I feel really lucky to um, have this great relationship yeah. with um, yeah. Shubash. Kanai Law was his father. So yeah, I think yeah, that, that's um, been huge. I, I think that uh, that's one of the, the you know, if, if someone was to come across you in this instrument, there a lot of people might just think, oh, well, why don't I just go order one and slap my own pickup on it? But I think that to that point, you know, <laughs> you see this a lot of times on the on the the sitar um, subreddit on Reddit. Hmm. People are like, "Hey, I found this sitar on eBay <laughs> or or on on Amazon or something. Is this good? Should I buy this?" And the answer is always no. And because you you really need to be getting it through a trusted source. You know, if if you're not there to pick up that instrument you need to be getting it from someone who who has been there that has a good that relationship with that builder who's going to know you know that what they get on a consistent basis is going to be a really high quality instrument yeah that's you know, important and, you know i had done one of these interviews with um uh, nick dylan of old delhi music and they do harmoniums primarily mm. and in their experience they used to have all these harmoniums made and they would they would get them delivered and they would be of all varying qualities and they'd spend a lot of time sort of repairing them getting them up to sort of a, a standard that because he didn't want to sell anything that he wasn't really confident in right For him that ultimately resulted in you know building their own harmonium factory and launching their own brand because it was the only way he could have that quality control so right i think that your relationship you know, is, is really important to knowing that like the instruments that people are getting are quality. They're not just like some random instrument out of nowhere. Totally. Yeah. I, I don't think I'd be, I wouldn't be able to do this type of business if I didn't have that relationship. You know, I, I can't sell something that I wouldn't want to play, you know? And um, so, yeah, that, that's like the groundwork of this whole thing is yeah. having that good maker. Well, I feel like we've talked a lot about, about, about you and and about the instrument we really need to hear the instrument totally. so um i'm not we'll see how well this translates over zoom i'm not <laughs> totally sure i know but if you want to to play a little bit and demo for us maybe through the amp so we can get a sense of, of how this setup works yeah let's give it a go um i'm just going to kind of walk you through every step of you know yeah. plugging it into the jack and uh, my amp is a boss katana mm -hmm. and um I'm not crazy about it, honestly, but I, I had this giant all tube, this four by 10, and it, it was just moving around so much without getting used. Yeah. I, this is just more compact, um, but it's it's pretty good. Yeah, they're so, popular, popular amps. Yeah, they're not bad. So um, 
I'm going to start. I'm, I'm going to get into the quarter inch jack here. Yep. And then my master volume, I like a little bit just below max so okay. that it's not maxing out. Um, Have you ever thought then, about adding like a, a tone control or like a Q knob to adjust your resonant peak at all? I have, and that might be something we explore. There's there's something I like about the simplicity yeah. of just not having a bunch of stuff on board the body. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll see, you know, right now it's it's working out pretty balanced. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that is something to maybe explore with. Um, but right now, I, I don't feel it's fully necessary. Sure. All right, Let's see how we sound. <laughs> So I'm at a pretty good volume in the amp. Let's hope I'm not peaking on your end. Yeah, Just very nice. Style. Now, in terms of what we're hearing in the room there, your condenser mic is sort of just picking up the room space. Is that correct? Or Right. I've got the condenser mic here that's running into an interface yeah. for our call. And then, yeah, that's just picking up the sound of the amp in the room. Yeah, yeah. Can you now, I sort of, <laughs> I think like the immediate like fun thing someone thinks of is like, Let's put effects on it. <laughs> what happens if you if you, you put a little reverb or delay th through the yeah. amp? Because I think the katana has some built-in effects, right? It does. Yeah, let's try it. There is a little reverb right now, but that's it. You might even be able to turn the amp up a slight bit more. OK. Delay. <laughs> some other ones yeah i mean obviously like probably not required for everyone but it's just sort of fun while we're you know why not yeah i could see particularly if you're playing live being able to have just a little bit of reverb you know whether it's you know, through an amp or a pedal or through the PA, whatever it is, to be able to just give you a little room sweetness. 
Totally. Now, how uh, can you run this direct directly into a house PA system? Yes. Um, you'll want to have a DI box. Sure. It's definitely helpful, but I've done that where I've run directly into a house DI box or right into a mixer. Mm -hmm. um, that's the great thing about this custom made uh, preamp is that the impedance is made so that it's it can match up with with anything. Yeah, yeah. And that's the goal is like I want people to be able to plug in and not be like, does it have phantom? Does it have this or that or the other thing? It's like your likelihood of it sounding good in any configuration is, is there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it sounds it sounds really nice. I mean, I know there's more videos on your on your YouTube channel of you performing with this electrified. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's some demo videos. So I would there. say, like, yeah, if people want to really hear it, that's probably the place to go because obviously this is through Zoom and it's just sort of a a quirky setup. Even sort of now with the condenser mic there, I'm sure it's picking up a little bit of the instrument itself acoustically, but that's sort of a nice thing that it's not that you can't still mic the instrument and have it electrified when you're performing live, right? I mean, have exactly. you ever run into any that's, phase issues doing that or? No, that's actually what I like to do. If I am in a situation where I don't have to be like super high volume, I can have a live mic. Yeah. I like to have a live um, dynamic or condenser like kind of down near the bridge and then the direct in as well. And then I blend them. Yeah, yeah. And what that allows me is I don't get the feedback problems that I would from just relying on the live mic. Mm -hmm. But then I get some of the natural warmth of, I mean, these instruments acoustically are, are very warm yeah. and, and full. So yeah. yeah, that's kind of what I like to do. And, and you can see I'm right by the amp here and the, the feedback is just non-existent. Mm -hmm. I'm just pressing buttons on the amp, so. <laughs> yeah, you can, probably, you can probably just go back to regular reverb at this point, but I think yeah. that's a really uh, sort of good example in a way, because people can really tell with, by having the repeats and the delay. It's like, you know what you're hearing is, is the, the coming out of the amp, yeah. Totally. Well, really exciting, really exciting, Will. As this entrepreneur who's made a product and is, is selling it, um, what do you want to see happen with this over the next, you know, short period of time? Is this, do you want this to become more of your day-to-day -day focus? Is, is this, or you have other ideas for new things you want to start uh, creating? I think my real goal is to be a kind of go-to source for this very specific instrument. Mm -hmm. It's, it's very specific. It's a, it's a sitar that can be plugged in that also is very good for traveling with. Yeah. Like you can bring this on the plane and that is huge. Yeah. And to be able to travel somewhere and play an instrument that you feel good about playing and not checking it yeah. in the world of sitar is huge. So like if you don't say like, I don't need an electric sitar, you can just get this. It's the same. It's the instrument without the electronic thing. Sure. So I really want to be a source for that musician who's like, you know, I want a good sitar that I can travel with. I want a good sitar that I can plug in. And yeah, I want to see that kind of reach the people that are looking for that and be known for that specific source. And mm -hmm. I don't have a desire to do other instruments because I don't know them, right? Like harmoniums are popular now. They're selling and people have been like, you could sell a lot of harmoniums. I'm like, I don't love harmonium. Yeah. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Um, and I also, I do import tampuras too, instrumental tampuras from yeah. Kanaiwal that I think are great. And I feel like everyone should sing with a tampura that is getting into rag because it's a really important part of the study um, from my experience. Do you think that you'll continue to, to make uh, introductory educational videos on your YouTube channel as well, of just about Indian music in general? Yeah, that's definitely a habit that I see continuing that I started more regularly in the past year. Yeah. And I really enjoy it, and and I'm I just want to offer that kind of value and guidance for people that are that are learning, and not everyone can find the right teacher so easily. And I feel like as a Western person who studied both music deeply, I, there's a way that I can translate it mm -hmm. that is helpful. And I still encourage people to find like a guru, you know, and. But I feel like there's a way that I can offer a lot to someone on the path of, of learning, you know. How, how, how many students do you teach now? Do you have like a small group? Or? It's a small batch. It's a small batch. Um, I do individual lessons and they're all remote now. Um, yeah. 
I've had times where I've had like, you know, usually between five and 10 at a time. Oh, okay. So a small batch. Yeah. And, and I assume you if, know, if, if you want to learn more about you lessons, um, obviously th this sitar with the pickup in it, um, what's the best way for them to, to find you, to look you up and get that information? Yeah, all of that is on my website, um, willmarshmusic.com. You'll see that the shop is there, lessons are there, there are links to my existing complimentary lessons. Mm -hmm. um, you can hear my own music. So that's kind of like the go-to place um, for everything uh, that I offer. Do you ever perform with um, a tabla player or um, like a dua? Um, Jungle Bandi with other Indian mus classical musicians? When I'm in India, I get to perform, and I get to perform in Calcutta with uh, Ashish, Ashishji's nephew, Shiraz Ali Khan, is an amazing um, sarod player, no. uh, kind of close to my age. And so he would uh, have me play with him on some of his programs, um, and that's always a really special experience. Oh, yeah. It's been a fun chat. I, 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 you know, the sitar is an instrument that to me i really love i love studying it i wish i was way better at it i, <laughs> I wish i could you know really be a lot more dedicated to it and and it's you know i have a passion for it and the same at the same time it can also totally drive me mad <laughs> because it's like you there's there's so many things about its its construction that can be so infuriating right the friction pegs, um, getting a good recording sound, you know, it's, it's has so many variables, you know, it can change with yep. humidity and all these things, right? So whenever someone is sort of looking at ways to modernize that instrument without losing its, you know, natural charm and acoustic performance, right? I think is, is, very interesting and like that's why i was like oh let's talk because i have a lot of questions i want to know more about this you know so mm. uh, i think you're doing a really great job with this and i i wish you obviously the best of luck with it going forward yeah thank you for having me it's it's fun to get to share this project and like i said i i know there are people out there who are looking for this and and need this kind of um product and i want to be someone who can offer it consistently you know it's not a one-off thing and yeah that's what i noticed like there are professional sitar players who have made these but they've just made it for themselves you know that's not like it's they're existing for anyone who who wants to get it um yeah so yeah i i appreciate um getting to share and, and for you having me once again if you just want to mention your website so everyone has it yeah so willmarshmusic.com you can find performance videos you can find the shop with this instrument uh everything that i do is available there and then um and your youtube channel how often do you say you post now is it is it about every couple of weeks or is it more than that yeah every couple of weeks i'm getting to the point where now i've got like a regular shooting schedule every week right. so i'm building up a lot of content and then i'm going to be on a weekly release schedule awesome um, i love so that. you can look forward to yeah stuff coming out consistently pretty much from now um moving forward well, that's and great. i also have a have a podcast that I interview musicians from around the world with, and it's called the World Music Podcast, oh, and wow. it's it's on all the main podcast platforms. It's also on my website, and that's been fun. I, I talk to sitar players, I talk to people from all different styles of music around the world, and uh, that's been a fun project to be. That's amazing. I didn't even know to. about that. I mean, Will, I'm tried. I was trying to do my research on you beforehand, and I missed that completely. So. It's pretty new, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome, man. That's great. Well, yeah, so so what's that called again? It's called the World Music Podcast. World Music Podcast, okay. Last question. If you had to uh, pick a uh, dessert to mm. eat every day for a week, what would the dessert be? A good question. I can be very specific with this. Um, <laughs> there is a one brand of ice cream that I absolutely love. It's called Coconut Bliss. And it's the only non-dairy ice cream that tastes legit. And they have a chocolate peanut butter ice cream. And I could eat that every day easily for a week. 
Fantastic. All right. So there we go. Coconut <laughs> bliss, everyone. All right. Well, that's our interview for today. Um, I'm going to start that again. I'm, this part I always mess up. I always mess up the ending. It's because you know what's happening is someone while we're talking, someone's texting me because I didn't turn my phone on the silent. Typical. Mm -hmm. All right, Will, well, that's our interview. Thank you very much for doing this. And if everyone wants to find out more about you, please visit Will's website and YouTube channel. And that's it for now. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. All right, that's it. There we go. Great. I feel like we covered a lot.